McKenzie and I'm a communications officer with WHO and today we're doing something a little bit different. We are joining you live here from the hospital San Orsola. We're in the city of Bologna in northern Italy and we're here today to talk to some WHO colleagues and partners who are working on issues related to the design uh, and structure of hospitals and other health facilities in relation to COVID-19. So later on in this broadcast, I'll be speaking to a WHO engineer and a WHO architect who are working on the COVID response uh, with us at the World Health Organization. Before I do that, I want to tell you just a little bit about where we are uh, and the background of this hospital. So first to join me, I'm here with Maria Tadolini. She's a researcher at the University of Bologna, which is affiliated with this hospital. Uh, and she's also a WHO consultant who, uh, in the pre-COVID era, <laughs> was working with our global TV program. And she continues to work with the TV program today. Thank you, Marina, for joining us. You're welcome. Can you start by just telling me about your position, your work? Yes. So I'm as a researcher at the University of Bologna, and uh, I'm a, a specialist in infectious diseases. My main field of interest is a TB, uh, tuberculosis, uh, MDR, TB, and latent TB infection. But of course, in the COVID-19 era, uh, I was uh, also asked to support uh, my staff uh, to uh, in the response and the preparedness for the epidemic. So I joined the team of the my colleagues, and I participated to the uh, COVID-19 activities. Um, we are here in the hospital that uh, Sant'Orsola is one of the biggest hospital in Italy and uh, definitely the biggest hospital in Bologna and in Emilia Romagna region. The hospital is a historical hospital. It was um, uh, firstly established in 1529 uh, and uh, of course uh, now uh, it counts a lot of different buildings and is structure in uh, different uh, pavilions. Um, there are more than 30 different pavilions that have been uh, built in different years and different periods. So they belong to different uh, um, periods. And um, the, the capacity of the hospital is around 1,500 beds. Uh, and there are more than 5,000 people working uh, in the hospital. Uh, uh, with more than 20,000 people visiting, passing through the hospital uh, on an average day. Um, on a yearly basis, we count uh, roughly 72,000 admissions. Uh, uh, so it's a, a large volume of activities on a routine that had to be reorganized and restructured during the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Yeah, thank you. I think we can actually just come over here and show you a map of the hospital. I think sometimes when people think about a hospital, they think it's one single building. When actually you can see here on this map that, as you said, Marina, it's more than 31 different buildings spread out over uh, from end to end about two kilometers. So here you get a sense of just how complicated it might be when you have a hospital of this size with buildings of different ages and all of a sudden have to work to uh, not only have a place to treat people with COVID, but also to keep people who are coming to the hospital safe yeah. uh, so that they can still access health services here. Yeah, as you can see from the maps, uh, there are many different buildings. Uh, for example, the number five is the, actually the emergency room. So it's uh, probably one of the first uh, uh, pavilion that is uh, um, visited from the patients when they are sick. But uh, from pavilion number five, uh, patients uh, who need admission may be transferred to many other pavilions according to their needs and according to, the, um, to the, their medical uh, conditions. So uh, it was not that easy actually to organize activities in such a structure because uh, in such a building because uh, um, of course uh, during the COVID-19 epidemic uh, initially activities were centralized in the infectious diseases department but when the number of patients exceeded the capacity of beds of the infectious diseases department other wards had to be uh, uh, found to accommodate uh, 
COVID-19 patients and actually the directors of the hospital had to select the, which uh, pavilions was the most appropriate uh, to respond to the uh, critical needs of those patients. Uh, so actually, starting from pavilion number six, which is the infectious diseases department, uh, they had to, to select beds to accommodate patients in number five, and then they moved also to pavilion 25. So the, the main uh, features that uh, allowed uh, uh, the accommodation to um, COVID-19 patients were of course, to have uh, enough space to move uh, uh, with uh, uh, taking all the precautions also for the staff, uh, to have enough space to divide uh, the dirty and the clean path, uh, also enough beds, uh, of course, uh, and enough uh, oxygen flow for the oxygen therapy. Uh, so it was um, I mean, a lot of criteria have been taken into consideration to select the pavilions uh, that could be utilized for the epidemic and definitely one of the um, decision was also to allocate some words for the suspect uh, so for patients who were still waiting for the confirmation from the lab so that could not be accommodated together with the confirmed patient so some words were for the suspect some words were for the confirmed cases and uh, in the peak of the epidemic uh, actually the capacity the bed capacity for the COVID-19 patients was more than 200 actually 235 beds for COVID-19 uh, and uh, 45 for suspect and more than 70 beds in intensive care unit so the numbers had to expand very rapidly to respond to the needs. Thanks very much Marina um, and we'll actually come back and have Marina join us again for uh, an opportunity for you to ask questions if you would like towards the end of this social media live. If you do want to ask questions if you're following us on Twitter you can use the hashtag AskWHO and if you're following us on other social media platforms you can simply leave your question in the comments. Uh, so we've seen a little bit of an overview of some of the challenges associated with quickly adapting a hospital of this size to deal with COVID-19. Uh, we actually have a number of people at the World Health Organization who are helping health facilities, not just here in Bologna, but all around the world, to find ways to do that. So next I want to introduce you to my colleague Anja Borovic who is uh, trained as an engineer and also has a public health background. And Anya has been here in Bologna for a number of months working with the hospital on readiness for COVID. So Anya, if you can just, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I know you've been very busy this week, so I appreciate taking the time uh, to talk to our viewers about the work that you're doing. Can you just explain a little bit about your day-to-day -day work and what you're doing here in Bologna? So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anya, I'm a civil engineer and day-to-day uh, uh, -day work uh, is uh, different every day. So here, for example, we have, uh, as you could see, uh, so many buildings and so many things to visit and to assess and then to uh, support on uh, ad adapting to the next challenges. So I prefer to... Uh, not talk about buildings, I prefer to talk about environment. So we have an example here, which is uh, more clear for the viewers to understand. Here we have, for example, hematology. So during COVID uh, and uh, in this, after uh, the acute phase, we can see that inside it's not possible to um, have all the visitors, all the patients, um, fitting in the same place and respecting the distancing. So to create a safer environment, um, we assessed uh, the inside, the waiting room. We assessed how many people could fit inside, but then we need to see how uh, the people that are waiting outside will be still safely uh, adjusted. So uh, we are improving this, uh, this external space and uh, for now, 
it's it's a nice day but uh, with the sun and with the rain we still need to protect them so we are improving this uh, uh, external space as much as the inside so the environment is quite important um, all the environment the workers the healthcare workers need to be as safe as possible when they work during covid um, a facility was like a second home for them. They were, for example, um, a lot of healthcare workers were sick, so the others had to double their shifts. So it was really like a second home. And uh, we need to make sure that while they work, they are safe. Same for the patients and same for the visitors. So this is kind of our job. I was supporting this hospital um, and we were visiting uh, many structures and finding the best way to adapt such an old building with so many different features to COVID uh, uh, needs. So basically every day you're visiting different buildings within this hospital and you also were going out into smaller health facilities in the region. Uh, and you mentioned it to me as almost a second set of eyes. So sometimes you're visiting a health structure and you're able to see something that might need to be changed, that even a small change could make a big difference. Uh, you told me about an example about a small health facility the other day that you had visited and were able to provide just some advice that helped them keep not only the patients but the health workers safe. Yes. So um, the added value of having someone uh, uh, coming from outside that has, has never been to this hospital is that you see something every day for 10 years of your life and that's how you use that to be. So for me, uh, coming from outside, I can see the differences and I can see how something can be modified. And this was something that for them was really uh, helpful. An example, a very practical example, uh, we were walking through um, some wards, some patient rooms, and I noticed that they had the, <laughs> the tables where the patients eat, and it was a double room, and the table was quite small, and the chairs was faci were facing uh, one another. So for me it was like, oh yeah, this should be improved, let's make the table longer. So we respect the distancing between the patient while they're, they're eating, they, they don't have the mask. And for them being used to have uh, this single table for many years, they were like, oh yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, we should do that. So yeah, I think this is a kind of an added value for us. So sometimes even a small change like that can make a big difference to the safety of, of health workers and patients. Um, sometimes the simplest uh, changes are the most effective ones and um, I can make another example um, we work a lot on the circuit of the flow of patient the flow of the staff uh, uh, where they enter where they exit where they pass uh, uh, make sure they do not cross so you mean like how people will move through a building exactly. yeah exactly and um, the most effective uh, uh, circuit is the simple one where you uh, go from point A to point B and you don't get lost, you know exactly where to go instead of, you know, run, going around, crossing paths, being confused. And this is like a very simple solution and we try to look for the simplest solutions that are most effective and that support the work of the staff so we are kind of really trying to support what they do make their life easier as much as we can and Anya can you tell me a little bit about where we are now we're just about to be coming up soon to the maternity ward and I know you've spent a lot of time here and this is an interesting example of somewhere you've worked because the building is such a mixture of old and new environments so here there is a, um, the new building starting uh, uh, the first uh, digging, it will start today. Um, 
This building is very, very old, and uh, we are we are building something new, but we still have activities. Imagine a hospital like a living being, so you cannot just stop something and uh, continue somewhere else. You need to work around it. So while we're building something new, uh, we still have to make things work. But being an old building, we need to adapt and adjust some modifications in the rooms, with the ventilation, with the flows. So this was a, a very nice example of new and old, still working at the same time, but in a safer way. Um, just to reintroduce you in case uh, we have new, new followers, we are live at the Hospital San Orsola in Bologna, and we're talking to WHO colleagues who are involved in the design and structure of health facilities in the context of COVID-19. Welcome back to the social media live from the World Health Organization. Uh, I'm Lindsay McKenzie and I'm here with my colleague Anna. We are talking about health facility design and structure in the context of COVID-19. So how does the design and layout of a health facility, uh, how is that impacted by COVID and are there ways that we can look at the design and structure of a health facility to make sure that not only patients but also, also health workers and other visitors to these facilities can be safe. Uh, so my colleague Anna is an architect working with WHO. Anna, can you tell us a little bit about your work with WHO? What are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how does an architect get involved in the COVID response? Okay, good morning to, to all and uh, uh, during uh, our day and uh, during this month uh, we support uh, in a multidisciplinary way with uh, my team but also with uh, a technical network of uh, universities and other institutions that is called TECNE. We supported many countries uh, in order to provide the best uh, design solution for the, all the facilities related to COVID-19. So uh, basically we are providing a layout and feedbacks to some layouts um, for facilities related to COVID, like uh, treatment center, but also screening areas, but also uh, self-quarantine areas and so on. Okay, and so you're working with something that I've often heard referred to as a help desk. And not only our partners, so for example, UNHCR or UNDP, can ask for a request for support, but also uh, ministries of health or regional health actors can come to WHO and say, could you give us advice about how to restructure or change our health facility to make it ready for COVID? Is that right? Yes, it's right. And so how many requests has the help desk received around uh, so far? Uh, we received uh, 40 support requests and uh, uh, if you want, I can show you some data. Sure. Maybe you can give us an example of the type of design support that you would provide. Exactly. As you can see here, uh, we received 40 requests, as I said, mainly from the Africa region, but uh, also from all the other countries. And uh, we support uh, um, structures for an amount of 3,500 beds. And uh, as you can see here, we are mainly dealing with uh, permanent structure in existing facilities. So basically how to repropose existing facility in COVID treatment center or COVID ward. But also uh, we are dealing with uh, some temporary structure, tents, container, prefab. So it's a very uh, different uh, situation according to, to the scenario. And uh, just to give an overview of the type of uh, work we, we do, uh, usually we receive the support request and uh, we work on it in collaboration with our uh, TECNE members and we provide at the end uh, a technical report with uh, all the drawings, uh, all the diagrams and all the information provided in order to set up the facility and in order to understand the uh, functioning of, uh, of the facility. So at the end, uh, the final product is uh, um, something similar to this document. And uh, just to give an overview of the typology of work, um, mainly we are working, uh, as you can see here, drawing the, the specific uh, uh, layout according to the situation because the support we provide is an ad hoc support 
Then usually we do also a 3D model. Uh, here I'm showing an example of a treatment center in Burkina Faso uh, that uh, it will be built uh, for COVID, but uh, it should be resilient also to other diseases. And uh, we think that uh, the 3D model is really useful uh, for uh, non-technical people that should uh, understand the functioning and the typology of the, of the space. And uh, after that, as I showed before, here we see the technical report with uh, all the diagrams. For example, these diagrams show the uh, staff spaces in green and the mix area in red but also we have some diagrams with arrow to a better understanding of the flows inside the facility. So basically this is the work we, we are doing uh, every day. Okay, thank you very much Anna for giving us that example of the kind of work that you're doing. So here you've met my colleague Anna who is an architect and also my colleague Anya who is an engineer. You can come over here if you want to Anya. Um, and we're actually, we can take questions from our viewers if you would like to understand more about the role of an engineer or an architect in the COVID response. You can ask your questions by using the hashtag AskWHO on Twitter or by leaving a comment uh, in the comment section on other social media platforms. I'll start out just by asking you, Anya, now you're in Bologna and you're working with, with WHO to help with hospital readiness. I'm curious about your background and where you've worked before coming here to Italy. I worked before in uh, different uh, epidemics, uh, mostly cholera and uh, Ebola. So in different countries, this is the first time I work actually in Italy. And um, yeah, I worked uh, in designing um, and uh, readapting structures for different uh, diseases, infectious diseases in different countries. You were involved in the Ebola response in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I think, just before coming here. Yes. Was there any kind of learning from working on that response that informed what you're doing now? Um, there, is a, <laughs> there is a lot of learning. I think uh, what, uh, what we applied in, during this COVID is that, uh, and understanding that also from Congo, is that every country is different. Every uh, town is different, every hospital is different, uh, everything is different. So what we do is uh, really give a support that is built around the context and the facility itself and the people that will use it. So as my colleague was saying, it's like an ad hoc support. Um, one question that we have from a viewer is how does WHO extend architectural support to hospitals? Um, well, um, in, in the case of Bologna, we, we started supporting uh, an hospital because uh, one of our colleagues was uh, uh, deployed here and uh, uh, looking at uh, the, the, the environment, uh, we, we start uh, working together to support her also on the design part, for example, uh, she, she went in so many different uh, hospitals in the region here and she, she needed support uh, to, to the design of uh, some uh, different spaces to, um, to the understanding of the different uh, needs, areas, the flows inside the facilities. And so I think uh, that is uh, uh, really important also to have uh, uh, architects in the in the team uh, because it's really important to, to work in a multidisciplinary way uh, in order to take into account while designing to all the different aspects that uh, uh, are are uh, inside in such a complex uh, uh, such a complex structure. If I can add, <laughs> the the most interesting part is that we are looking at the same. Uh, layout with uh, different eyes so if I cannot see something of or if I see it differently she will complete it and and on the reverse so we have uh, different uh, different views on things uh, and this is very very important to not miss anything when you look at the at the hospital 
There's one project that um, you've been talking about since I've been here, and that's you've been referring to it as the hospitals of tomorrow or the hospitals of the future. So some of the learning from COVID you're hoping to not only use today, but to be able to respond to um, whatever comes at us in the future. Can you tell me a little bit about that project? So as you know, COVID like uh, took us and shaked us <laughs> a lot. And people start, uh, started already think like, so what will uh, the future hospital look like if I have to build something new right now? How will I make my, my entrance, my, my flow? What's the ventilation is going to be? Uh, are the rooms big enough? Like, what are the new standards? So we were thinking about all of this with the hospital itself, being on the ground and being here to see all the difficulties and all the challenges in the same moment that they happened helped us to see already uh, we are thinking about the future and we are trying to uh, anticipate whatever it can be. Of course we cannot think of all the possible scenarios so the answer is that we need to build a hospital that's really flexible to adapt to as many scenarios as possible. It's very complex, I understand, <laughs> but this is the, um, the hospital of the future uh, challenge. And if I can add uh, something from an architectural point of view, as Anya was saying uh, before, um, we are dealing in this kind of in this kind of project. We are dealing, of course, with uh, technical requirements, the ventilation, uh, the materials, and uh, and so on. But uh, also, uh, we should always, uh, if we think to the future, we should always thinking into account all the uh, soft skills and uh, that can contribute for the comfort of patients and staff that uh, in a hospital are dealing with uh, some stressful situation so we have to take in mind uh, a balance of uh, all the different uh, aspects so we have a question from Twitter and that is for you Anya can you give any specific examples of any design change that was made for COVID-19 so many <laughs> as I was saying before um, we can apply a very simple example uh, the distancing so before it was uh, uh, the waiting rooms, the waiting areas were really crowded. Uh, people were sitting one next to the other. So something that it was done uh, very quickly, it was, you know, those chairs that are all attached one to the other. Um, now you can sit in one and then you have to, to measure uh, a distance and then to sit on the other. That's a very simple and quick um, change that we made uh, like as soon as possible yeah again and sometimes it's just the small changes that make a big difference um, I think we'll probably end here I wanted to bring it back to Marina who is joining us who works at the hospital as a researcher um, just before we end I thought you could tell us a little bit about, about your experience here going through COVID I've seen, and I'm not sure if, if we can walk closer to it, Mark, but there's a sign, for example, in the background here, and these are all over the, the grounds of the hospital, uh, basically thanking health workers, and not just health workers, but everybody who's involved in responding to COVID for their work here. So maybe Marina, if you can just tell us a bit about your experience. Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, uh, it has been a very tough experience, as you can imagine, uh, but, uh, uh, also, we received a lot of support. Uh, the medical staff, the health staff in general, received a lot of support uh, and uh, it was a, a very nice lesson learned. That, so in a critic emergency, we could see how other staff, other hospital staff, not usually dealing with infectious diseases, for example, joined our team to work together in multidisciplinary teams. And that was uh, really uh, something that was crucial to to deal with the with the burden of the COVID-19. But we received also a lot of support from the hospital direction, from the health authorities in general, and from the town. A lot of people, volunteers, uh, medical students, uh, join us in this effort. And uh, if we could. Uh, achieve some success in this uh, fight. It's really thanks to um, 
uh, I mean, a, F, a joint effort that uh, was only possible with the, uh, with the support of, from so many people. Of course, technical support from WHO was also crucial uh, because uh, they joined us uh, during the preparation and during uh, actually the, uh, the, the activities. So it's very important also for the future to count on this kind of support. So we felt, we never felt alone in this fight and this post is just uh, you you can find many of them in the hospital everybody good wanted to say thank to the doctors and nurses involved in this fight but actually is a cumulative and uh, uh, collaboration so I, I i really would like to take the positive lesson from this uh, uh, threat <laughs> Absolutely, and we've heard that from many people that we spoke to at the hospital over the course of this week, that despite all the difficulties, one silver lining, you could say, is how much people have come together to respond to COVID. Yeah. Um, so Marina, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you to our followers for joining us. Um, I hope it was interesting for you to have the opportunity to hear from an architect and from an engineer about that side of the COVID response. One thing I should say just before closing, uh, we have a few questions about wearing masks outside and why are we doing that today because we're in a hospital this whole area that we're walking around is the grounds of a hospital and there are very vulnerable people here um, and because we're close together when asking questions that's why we have masks on so thank you very much for following if you'd like to learn more about for example the work of the help desk you can visit who.int and the weekly situation reports that we publish often have updates about the work of the help desk Otherwise, please follow along. Tonight we have a press conference from Geneva that will be live. Lots of questions from journalists and the latest updates on COVID tonight on the same social media platforms that you're watching us on now. Thanks very much and have a good day.